freshman Congresswoman Elhan Omar is certainly feeling the heat for her comments earlier this week about American political support for Israel, which some took as anti-Semitic. Next, I'm joined by two members of the media who wrote two very different op-eds in reaction to the controversy. Freshman Congresswoman Elhan Omar created a firestorm of controversy this week for this tweet, saying American political support for Israel is motivated by money, or as she put it casually, all about the Benjamins, baby. Well, the Minnesota Democrat then responded to another tweet claiming the American Israel Public Affairs Committee, known as AIPAC, is supporting American politicians. This prompted House Democratic leadership to issue a joint statement condemning Omar's quote, use of anti-Semitic tropes and prejudicial accusations about Israel's supporters, and they called on her to apologize. Well, Omar did unequivocally apologize for her remarks, saying she is listening and learning, but standing strong. As you can imagine, that apology did not appease the president who had this to say. I think she should either resign from Congress, or she should certainly resign from the House Foreign Affairs Committee. All right, joining me now, Batia Unger Sargon, opinion writer for Forward.com, which describes itself as a digital, independent Jewish journalism site. And Peter Feld, also with Forward.com and also a political strategist at the Insurrection. Both wrote op-eds this week on this very same topic for the site on opposite sides of the issue. And that's why we thought it would be perfect to have both of you here on the set uh, to talk about this, uh, given that there are so many different opinions about it. But Batia, let me start with your op-ed, because you wrote uh, in the title of it is Ilhan Omar tweeted something anti-Semitic again. Uh, you write, her tweet cast APAC as a nefarious organization controlling the levers of power, buying politicians with Benjamins and bribing them to betray American values. It belongs in a Der Strumer cartoon, not on the Twitter feed of a U.S. Congresswoman. So first, walk us through why you got to that conclusion just from the simple language that she used. The Forward is an independent, progressive Jewish publication. Our job is to call out anti-Semitism where we see it, whether it's on the right or on the left. And that's what we do. Yeah. So when Kevin McCarthy tweeted a disgusting anti-Semitic tweet, it was an ad right before the midterms and said, or right after the midterms, saying three Jews p bought these midterms, right? We called that out. That was disgusting and unacceptable. He didn't apologize. Mm. When President Trump started pushing an anti-Semitic conspiracy theory, alleging that Jews were paying for the refugees who were part of that caravan that was approaching right. America, that, we called that out. We have to have one standard, a zero tolerance policy for anti-Semitism on the right or on the left, and I totally reject the idea that you cannot stand up for Palestinian civil rights without being mum on anti-Semitism on the left. I completely reject that idea. Okay, fair enough, but I, I just want to get to that specific tweet that she said and walk us through how you got to the conclusion that that was an anti-Semitic trope, because your colleague obviously sees it differently. I'm going to ask him about that in just a moment, but explain to our viewers who may not be familiar with anti-Semitic tropes why you think that tweet was anti-Semitic, and can you have a conversation about the influence of money on American politics, like we do when it comes to the NRA, Big Pharma, all of fossil fuel, uh, when it comes to the issue of Israel and not be accused of being anti-Semitic. 100 yeah. percent. Yes, we should be having a conversation about the Israel lobby. We should be having a conversation about APAC. It is 100 percent possible to do that without being anti-Semitic or without um, s straying into even unintentionally anti-Semitic tropes. Yeah. One of the ways to do that is, as you know, Jews have literally been mass murdered for accusations that we are secretly controlling the levers of power with money, right? So when you know that a people has literally been mass murdered over that kind of portrayal, you want to be really accurate when you're talking about Jews and control and power and money. Yes, APAC is a powerful lobby. A lot of APAC's power comes from the fact that Israel is popular among Americans, mm. right? They are not controlling politicians. They are not controlling them with money. They are offering them a pro-Israel credential with which to go out and tell the American people that they are pro-Israel. So we need to be very, very careful in the language, right? If there were no Christians right. in America, APAC would have 
almost nowhere near the same amount of power. Okay, let me bring Peter into this and give you a chance to respond. You obviously wrote a very different opinion. In any, you, your uh, tweet, uh, sorry, you're titled, Ilhan Omar is not anti-Semitic for calling out APAC. Uh, and in your piece on the same website, you write, the problem is all lobbies, by definition, are designed to exert secret control over policy using money. Uh, and so unless you want to deny that there even is an Israel lobby, it can't be off limits to point out that it works in secret and uses money to bring out policy. So how are you getting the same, uh, from the same tweet, a very completely different conclusion? Well, I think her tweet was accurate and was not anti-Semitic. And it was not that different from Tom Friedman, who's a big Israel supporter, who when Benjamin Netanyahu spoke in front of Congress said, this speech was bought and paid for by the Israel lobby. Now, the Wall Street Journal this week reported that APAC raises and spends a hundred million dollars on its lobbying efforts that are not direct contributions to candidates, but they do a lot to direct those contributions. They, re they have a, a congressional council where your standing depends on your willingness to make contributions to pro-Israel politicians that, that APAC finds and identifies and even sets up meetings. So I think, you know, there's no question. I mean, when $100 million a year is, is, is raised and spent by APAC, countless more comes from donors that are bundled and affiliated with APAC. And then, you know, you have Sheldon Adelson, one, one of the biggest Republican donors, who says, I'm a single issue guy and my issue is Israel. Hayam Saban, who is similarly one of the biggest donors to the Democratic Party and had almost an identical quote, I'm a one issue voter and my issue is Israel. It's, it, it can't be off limits to talk about this money and say it's all about the Benjamins because otherwise it's gaslighting. So why is it that then some people believe that talking about Israel and its influence in terms of uh, policy makers is off limits? People don't want to touch it. And when you see the reaction, I mean, when all the issues that have, we've talked about, um, you know, people have criticized money's influence on our American political system. Mm -hmm. Why is that one different? The pro-Israel lobby at large, nothing to do with Jews per se, but as you were saying, all the groups that are involved with it, whether it's the military group, whether it's Christian, uh, Zionists, and evangelicals, and what have you. Well, I think they're scared because public opinion is changing. Batya says that people are, are you know, supportive of, of Israel in this country, but we're seeing those numbers change drastically. Right now we see uh, three to four times as many Americans think that the uh, Israel lobby has too much infu influence versus uh, the percent that think that it has too little. Uh, Forty percent of Americans and 56 percent of Democrats would support sanctions on Israel if it doesn't stop expanding settlements, which, which is going. And, and those sanctions are the S in what's known as BDS. So we have a lot of people who, who are changing their opinion. I think that, that the Israel lobby does not right. want this discussed. It is a nuanced conversation. We just tried to shed a little bit of light on it here, guys. I appreciate your insights. We're running out of time, but thank you. Appreciate it. All right. So Batia Unger, Sargon, Peter Felda, as I mentioned, thank you, guys. We're going to be right back. All right, that'll do it for me this week. Join me back here next Sunday at 4 p.m. to break down the major stories of the week. You can reach out to me, of course, as always, on social media. Now I turn it over to Reverend Al Sharpton and politics.